children in use um, YouTube page so you can find all of the previous um, presentations there there's some been some really good ones if you missed any you can go back and, and look at the ones that um, for the presenters that have given us permission to record them those are there um, if you want to get a certificate and all of that, um, links and copies of the slides, they'll be um, emailed out to you within a few days or so. So um, don't sweat it, it's coming. <laughs> um, well, we'll take a few questions at the end and we definitely wanna thank the Tennessee Chapter of National Association of Social Workers for providing um, CEUs for um, the present presentations that we've had, and also for Building Strong Brains Tennessee for sponsoring this event today. If you have any questions, please uh, just email Jen Drake Croft. And uh, now I'd just like to introduce our wonderful presenters. So we have Dr. Kristen Johnson, and she's an assistant professor and extension nutrition specialist with the UT Extension Family and Consumer Sciences Department. So she is a registered dietitian and received a PhD in nutrition, as well as a graduate certificate in gerontology from the University of Georgia. So as a, an extension nutrition specialist, her work focuses on chronic disease prevention and management through healthy food choices and increasing opportunities for healthy food access in Tennessee communities. So really important work um, that she's doing. And then Dr. Jennifer Ward, she has a PhD in child and family studies. And she also has a master's of public health degree from both the University of Tennessee. And her role with the um, University of Tennessee Extension Program, and she's the program director for the SNAP education program. There's one called TENSEP, which is the Tennessee Consumer and Education Program. And then there's another one called FNEP, <laughs> which is the Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program. So both of these are through our UT Extension uh, Services offices, which are in all 95 counties in the state. And so they um, target low resource families in an effort to improve lifestyle and ultimately prevent disease. So we welcome them today and their presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I think the next slide we can, um, we wanted to introduce our lens. Um, and a little bit more of our background. So, um, Dr. Johnson, if you want to go first. Yes, good morning. Thank you for the introduction and the opportunity to speak with you today. And as Christine mentioned, I am a registered dietitian and nutrition extension specialist with the University of Tennessee. And so a lot of my work is really um, promoting the importance of a healthy diet across the lifespan important from the very earliest of stages to the very latter of stages um, for an active, healthy life um, for all individuals. Um, however, for some U.S. households, um, they're unable to access enough food to provide for all members of their family, enough food for a healthy and active lifestyle. And so today my focus is really going to be introducing the concept of food insecurity, some background information, as well as sharing some statistics about food insecurity in the United States and in Tennessee. Great. And um, yes, thank you so much for having us here. We're excited to talk to you all today. Um, my name is Dr. Jennifer Ward, and I'm the program director, like you said, Christina, um, for the nutrition education programs that we run through UT Extension. Um, I'll describe more about those at the end because I think there's a lot of potential connections, especially given where, um, where all the participants are saying you work. Um, for now, I want to introduce myself and my lens. So we talk about food insecurity and families in Tennessee. My background is in, in studying families and culture and diversity through a qualitative lens. So I'll be talking less about the statistics um, and more about the lived experiences of, of families, um, especially families in Tennessee that experience food insecurity. 
Um, and I did most of my research with Sub-Saharan African refugee women, and I used to be the executive director at Bridge Refugee Services, which is a refugee resettlement agency. Um, and my interest was in looking at parenting and, and infant feeding, because we know that um, this population in particular had a strength, which is a proclivity to breastfeed, um, which is associated with positive health outcomes, but that changed over time in the United States. And what we found was there were a lot of structural barriers to that healthy behavior. And we see a lot of um, analogous things um, in, in terms of diet quality in Tennessee and, and food security. So um, I'll lean on my qualitative research in my portion of the presentation and talk about how race, class, and gender influence health behaviors, especially as it relates to nutrition. And so now I'll hand it back over to you, Dr. Johnson. Thank you. So as I hinted at earlier, um, food secure households are those households who have access at all times to enough food so that ha um, household members can live an active and healthy life. However, some households experience food insecurity, and these are households that at times throughout the year, they were uncertain that they would have enough or they were unable to acquire enough foods to meet needs for all of their family members because of insufficient money or insufficient resources for food. And food insecurity can be thought of as having, um, you know, being influenced by multiple dimensions. And so on the next slide, um, we can discuss that um, just a bit. Food insecurity um, can be influenced by a household's food availability, having enough food in a household's environment, um, their accessibility, a household's ability to have enough resources to get food, and then also utilization, a household's ability to choose and prepare safe and healthy foods. Um, food insecurity can also have a um, temporal component. Food insecurity may be something that a household experiences experiences intermittently over um, a period of time, or for some households, it may be something that they experience chronically um, very frequently over a period of time. And um, on the next slide, we can discuss um, different severities of food insecurity. Households who experience food insecurity may be classified as being low food secure or experiencing low, low food security or um, may experience an even severe, a more severe condition of very low food security. And when we think about households who experience low food security, these are um, households who may experience anxiety. They may experience a reduction in the quality, the variety, or maybe the desirability of the food that they're able to acquire. However, there is little or no indication of experiencing a reduction in amount of food intake. However, when we think about households who are char characterized as being very low food secure, these are households in which there are multiple indications of reductions in food intake over time. And so, for example, in 2018, more than 30% of households characterized or classified as being very low food secure reported that a household member did not eat for a whole day because there was not enough money for food. And 25% of these households reported that this happened in three or more months throughout the past year. And in 2018, it was estimated that approximately 11% of households were classified in the United States as food insecure. And on the next slide, we can show you a visual of that just so that you can um, take a look at that, that graph for yourself. And I think if we advance one more time, it might um, show us that 11% number. Yes, um, so 11% of US households in the United States were classified as food insecure, with about 4% of US households classified as being or having very low food security. Um, we can also look at some statistics in 2018 among U.S. households with children. And U.S. households with children um, experienced about 13.9 or right at 14 percent of households were considered food insecure. And on the next slide, we can get a, a graphic as well. And while that's um, showing up, um, I can use this slide to mention that among households, 
um, household members may experience food insecurity differently. So adults in a household may often go without food um, for an entire day. For example, like we talked about earlier, they may be hungry, choose not to eat as much as they may wish to um, because they're trying to shield their children from experiencing food insecurity. So overall in the United States, around 14% of households were considered food insecure among those with children. And about 7% of those households experienced um, or had food insecure children within those households. However, some U.S. households, household characteristics experience food insecurity at a higher rate than that national, these national averages than, than I've just talked about. And on the next slide, we can take a look about what some of those household characteristics that may um, oh, excuse me, <laughs> one more slide in between. So again, house, food insecure households and food insecure households with children. There. Uh, so now you can see what, I, see what I'm talking about at the same time. Some of the characteristics of households that experience food insecurity rates at higher than the national average include households that um, have Hispanic heads of house, Households with black non Hispanic heads of house um, households with incomes that are less than 185% of the poverty line. Um, we've already discussed that households with children, including households with younger children, children under 6 experience food insecurity at higher um, averages than than what is at the national average. Um, Additional factors are households headed by a single woman with children, single man with children, as well as women and men who are living alone. And on the next slide, we can jump into some Tennessee statistics. And in 2018, the food insecurity rate among all households in Tennessee was considered to be pretty close to that national average that we just discussed. So um, to about 12% of U.S. households were classified as food insecure with 5% experiencing very low food insecurity. But as we've already had an opportunity to discuss today, um, the COVID-19 pandemic has really caused many disruptions to our to our lifestyle. Um, it's disrupted school, you know, the school year for children. It's effective, affected employment. And so it's really not surprising that food insecurity prevalence has been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic as well. And so I wanted um, to discuss some of the um, estimates that have been um, produced about food insecurity and how it has been affected as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And the Northwestern um, University Institute for Policy Research has used data from the U.S. Census Household Pulse Survey to estimate food insecurity among U.S. households. And so when they compared estimates or um, you know, predicted what food insecurity would have been in February of 2020, and then compared it to their estimate of what they saw um, in April, food insecurity in April, um, they estimate that the rate of food insecurity among all households has more than doubled. And on the next slide, we can um, view their estimate among US households with children. And again, when um, viewing the predicted rate of food insecurity in February versus what they estimated in April, um, the food insecurity um, rate among U.S. households with children more than tripled. And they account that, you know, they say that about half to just over half of this increase can be explained by unemployment, but potential other factors such as missed school meals uh, may be a factor in this increase as well. Um, Feeding America also provides some estimates of how food insecurity will increase and has increased in 2020 at a local level. Um, so in addition to providing national and state averages and estimations, they also provide some county estimates as well. And so on the next slide, we can take a look at some of their estimates. And I provided a couple of examples here for you. Um, and also at the very bottom um, in included a link to their interactive website in case you're interested in looking at some estimates in the area in which you work or um, in which you live. And so, as um, Feeding America has used data to estimate 
the increase in um, food insecurity rates in Tennessee. You can see that they have estimated that among um, Tennesseans, in the food insecurity has increased from 14% to 19%, but there is variability across counties. Um, so for example, Lake County is listed here. Um, food insecurity there has expected, or is expected to increase from right at 20% to 26%. Um, they also provide estimates for child insecurity as well, child food insecurity. On the um, next slide, we can take a look at that. And in Tennessee, so statewide, child food insecurity is expected to increase from right at 18% to 27%. But again, similar to, um, to the previous slide, there is variability across the state in terms of county food, secure, food insecurity estimates. Um, so, for example, in Cock County, food insecurity among children is expected to increase from about 26% to 37%. And even in areas where there may be relatively lower um, instances of food insecurity, not to say that it's not an important number to consider, I did just want to point out that there's still a, you know, a substantial increase in child food insecurity. So I, I put Williamson County here just as an example, and you can see that they've increased, they're expected to increase from 5% to almost 14%. And on the next slide, um, I wanted to take some time to mention that Although, as we've discussed, food insecurity has increased across all households in the United States, this increase in food insecurity is not experienced equally across racial and ethnic groups. And so on this slide, um, it's depicting average percentage of food insecure households in the United States um, during the time of COVID-19. And all U.S. households are depicted in this lighter color, whereas the prevalence for U.S. households with children is depicted in this darker blue color. And you can see that Hispanic or Latino households, as well as Black households, are experiencing higher um, rates of food insecurity as compared to white and Asian households. And on the next slide, you can see that this holds true when we look at um, data estimating the average percentage of food insecure households in Tennessee. Again, Hispanic or Latino households as well as black households are experiencing higher rates of food insecurity as compared to white households who reside in Tennessee. And when we look at economic indicators, we can see these similar disparities. And um, this graph is depicting nationwide data, so not specific to Tennessee, but just across the United States. You can see that the percentage of respondents, and then this is households with children, who endorsed that they had worked the prior week, so the week before this data was collected. There were um, lower, fewer respondents who, um, from Black and Hispanic households who reported that they worked the prior week as compared to white households. And then on the next slide, we'll see a similar graph. And again, more Black and Hispanic-headed households um, reported that they expected to lose employment income in the next four weeks as compared to white households. And this cycle of food insecurity is really a highly stressful um, cycle that can really influence the health and well-being of individuals and families. And food insecurity has been um, linked to increased risk for conditions like diabetes, having high blood pressure, as well as depression and poor academic performance in school among children. And um, so this increase in food insecurity that we're seeing now, it, you know, can really be concerning when we think about the health and well-being of individuals and families in Tennessee and across our country. And so just to give you an example of how this stressful cycle can sort of feed um, into the stress and, and negatively impact the health and well-being, um, if you want to go back just a little bit, I can talk through this cycle just a bit and then I'll turn it over. Um, so individuals who are food insecure um, really have to make tough choices when it comes to providing for their family. It's a really stressful um, and difficult choices that they often have to make. That can, and these choices may affect diet quality, may affect eating behaviors. 
And whereas some of the ways that individuals and families may choose to cope with making choices to feed their families may have positive effects on their health and their well-being. For example, um, relying on strong social support networks or um, relying on food assistance programs like WIC or SNAP. Um, there are some ways that may have some negative impacts on health. And so, for example, individual, a household may live in an area where the foods that are available as well as affordable to them may be high in calories, but low in nutrients. And so this may exacerbate or lead to um, the existence of chronic conditions, which can lead to increased healthcare expenditures, effects on employment, perhaps through sick days or time taken off of work to go to doctor's appointments. All of this may decrease overall household income, which can then lead to increased spending trade-offs, such as having to make a difficult decision between buying medication or buying food, paying rent, or affording food. And so all of this can, again, just lead to this stressful cycle and highly um, stressful situation around food insecurity. And I'm now gonna turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Ward, who can continue our discussion. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Um, so, we know that a healthy diet that includes physical activities related to positive physical um, development for children and academic success. At its most basic, a healthy diet is one that includes adequate fruit and vegetable intake um, and emphasizes low fat dairy, um, a variety of protein sources, um, switching to whole grains and drinking more water than sugar sweetened beverages. Um, in our programming and in the FNEP and TENSEP, as um, was mentioned before, we use the MyPlate resources that can be found at um, choosemyplate.gov. Um, it's also important to note that nutrition status in childhood is related to nutrition in adulthood. So when we take a life course approach to nutrition, it's important to understand that the impact a healthy diet can have on children in the long term. And, and um, Dr. Johnson mentioned that. So we're talking about access to food and access to healthy food in particular. So if you don't have enough food, um, it's unlikely that you're that you're meeting these goals. Um, and diet quality in childhood relates to disease in adulthood, um, like cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. So this is in essence why we care and why we invest in encouraging families to change health behaviors. And as I'll explain, it isn't just about encouraging individuals to make changes, but to address the systemic issues that, that are involved um, in this too. Um, so in the next slide, you'll see some of the Tennessee specific statistics, um, and these can be found in the CDC state profiles on nutrition. Um, so what are we dealing with? In Tennessee, we have evidence that few people are meeting the daily recommendations for fruit and vegetable intake. Um, 10 percent and 11 percent is really low. Um, and more because the grants I manage are categorized as obesity prevention programs, we can see, and I have the statistic that over a third of adults in Tennessee are considered obese. I say this as a caveat because obesity is, can be a questionable proxy for health. And their problems um, with BMI as an indicator, but we this is what we have, um, and this is what we use. So our particular concern isn't necessarily the number on the scale, but the diet quality of individuals, and improving their ability to meet nutritional goals. Um, the percentage of families in poverty is also important to know because poverty is related to food insecurity and is considered part of the expanded basis, as we know. The experience of poverty exacerbates barriers to eating well. It's interesting, though, that a recent study found that actually it's middle income Americans that eat more fast food than low income Americans. Um, and I have that slide at the end. So, but even given that nutritional quality is an issue for all income levels, being poor makes it harder to be healthy in general. Healthy eating requires access to healthful foods in terms of both availability and affordability. Um, and so on the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more, and this is where we, we get into the culture and diversity stuff. So um, food insecurity happens at the intersection of gender, class, and race. And um, because we know that health disparities and negative health related to nutrition doesn't affect all populations equally. 
there are particularly vulnerable populations. And as Dr. Johnson explained, those charts, Hispanic and African-American headed households have higher than average rates of food insecurity. Um, they're also more likely to live in places where food access is low. We can see that a lot of this is related to institutionalized um, pol like racist policies, like redlining that's happened in the past. Um, and and current policy issues that make certain neighborhoods more likely to be a food desert and to lack access to healthful foods. Um, there's new research out um, by some colleagues at the University of Tennessee that indicates that trans transgender and gender nonconforming individuals are also a population that are more likely to experience food insecurity. And they're also less likely to receive services or seek help when um, they are hungry because of fear of discrimination and stigma related to their gender status. Um, women and children make up the majority of SNAP, um, SNAP recipients. And so when we talk about my program specifically, um, we're talking about SNAP eligible people. And so that is necessarily gendered. Um, and it's important to recognize the policy and environmental causes of these disparities to avoid placing blame on them. So for families who rely on food stamps who have a limited food budget, traveling farther to shop for food or having spotty access to transportation might mean relying more heavily on shelf-stable foods and less on fresh produce. Um, moreover, developed from a developmental perspective, kids need many chances to enjoy a new food. I don't know if anyone here has tried to engender a love of broccoli in a kindergartner. That's something I'm currently working on with my son and it isn't easy and it takes a lot of tries. And it's actually an adaptive response. Um, it's normal developmentally, but it costs a lot to throw food away in the trash. And so for families where food budget is really tight, it doesn't make sense to buy food that's likely to be rejected. And all of this in the food environment, although we're trying to change health behavior, we have to recognize that the odds are stacked against certain people and barriers to healthy eating are much higher and harder to overcome. In the next slide, I'd like to talk about um, more of the family and the systems perspective and how all this is interconnected. Um, and I like this and I like talking to um, the people in the audience now because these are some of the places that you work in schools um, and in social services. Food insecurity is both intergenerational and interconnected with other issues such as housing and employment. Research, recent research suggests that food insecurity in childhood is strongly related to food insecurity in adulthood, especially when a child experiences abuse or neglect. In a study published in 2014, Chilton and colleagues found through interviews with mothers that those with four or more reported ACEs were more likely to experience very low food security in adulthood. Thus, it's important to understand how these issues are interconnected and that food, um, food supports and social support should include um, a trauma-informed approach, um, mental health support, um, housing, employment, and food access are intertwined. Um, in the next slide, I'd like to talk about some popular health messages um, and problematize them a bit. So there are a lot of messages in the national popular discourse about how people need to change the way they interact with food to fix our food problems in our country and our culture. But often popular messages about food and health fail to recognize the complexity of the food system and the very real challenges people face in eating healthily. For instance, the popular discourse will often emphasize the need to invest more time in cooking and preparing food, cooking at home, and eating together. But these messages can miss the mark because they don't take into account the systems within which people are working and living. In other words, we can tell someone to eat an apple all day long, but if they can't find one or, or afford the one that they can find, it doesn't really matter. So it might seem hard to believe from where a lot of us sit today um, that acquiring an apple could be a difficult task, but as I've traveled to various counties in Tennessee and talked to people um, that work in our programs, it's clear that this is the case for many. I was in Benton County in West Tennessee um, before COVID, before I was banned from traveling, and learned from our UT Extension staff that many people in the county are about 15 minutes from a store that sells food, and they, they're lucky if there's any produce at all at that store. 
Um, another popular message is one that emphasizes the value of families eating together and the association between family meals and positive diet and socio-emotional health outcomes. Um, however, while there is research that, um, that connects those two, um, a more nuanced approach and some, some recent publications indicate that family dinners might actually cause more stress and discord for families who are struggling. So it's not an across the board um, association. So it isn't often that people don't know what is healthy or don't want to eat, engage in healthy eating. The issue of access and affordability is more central to their food choices. So next I'll talk um, and I'll give you an overview of our programs and what we do um, at UT. So SNAPED is the big name for the federal program and it is um, the money tied to uh, the farm bill and to SNAP benefits. And so we call it TENSEP in Tennessee. And then we also manage um, the FNEP program. And so these are both federally funded programs that amount to about six and a half million dollars a year. Um, we have agents and paraprofessionals and extension offices in all 95 counties in Tennessee that deliver our content to their communities. There are, more, there are four main facets of our work, and that is direct education, indirect education, social marketing, and PSE work. PSE stands for Policy, Systems, and Environment, and I'll explain more of that. The bulk of our work, I would say historically and presently, is um, aimed at nutrition education, which looks like a typical six to eight lesson curriculum that's delivered by our county staff in an array of community sites, including schools, senior centers, drug rehab programs, women's shelters, etc. Um, if you haven't had an extension agent knocking on your door at your place of work, then you can let us know. And um, if you're interested, we can set up, um, set someone up to come help teach. But um, more than that, our indirect education includes, so that would be more than, than just a specific class over time. It would be going to a health fair or a farmer's market and distributing distributing information about healthy eating, food safety, um, what vegetables are in season, and more. Social marketing is our marketing for good. It's essentially marketing for healthy behavior change. Um, that happens in print and in social media. So it's in both, um, it's in a variety of venues. Actually, right now we're running about a quarter million dollar um, social marketing campaign in the North Nashville area, which is considered a food desert. Um, using social influencers in an ad campaign to encourage the consumption of fruits and vegetables. And we chose that area because it was a particularly hard hit area, both um, in general. And then um, when the tornadoes came through and um, with COVID. So, so that, was a, that was why we chose that area. And so we're running ads on Facebook and um, with with the faces of some Nashville local influencers. But given everything I've talked about so far today, perhaps some of the most important work we're doing is our PSC work. And again, that stands for policy systems and environment. Um, this takes into account that it isn't just individual choice or lack of knowledge that impedes healthy diets. And we uh, are able to address more structural issues and make changes there. So, for instance, some of our mo most successful PSE work includes changing menus in cafeterias or at snack counters so that after one of our educators completes a lesson about healthy foods, those healthy foods are actually available where participants work or live. We see really great outcomes from our programs, including almost all of our participants report eating more fruits and vegetables after they go to class. Um, we include food resource management tips in our curriculum and our audience is SNAP eligible adults. So the most rewarding to me is when we hear that participant actually has food dollars left over at the end of the month. Um, we had one participant, I think it was in the Eastern region that said she normally the last week of the month was really thin and her kids would have to go without and she would go without food. Um, but that after our classes, she was she had forty dollars left over at the end of the month. That's a big it's a big deal. Those are kids that aren't hungry anymore. Um, so we're helping, you know, these parents have a few extra tools in their belt um, to save food and stretch the food and money that they do have. 
So as we wrap up, I'd like to say that I appreciate you coming to the Lunch and Learn and hope that you did, in fact, learn something new. I especially hope that when you think about how you can use your influence in places where Tennesseans work, learn and play that you can help support healthy food environments and supportive policies for family that recognize the inner all the interconnected issues with food insecurity and access. I think now we can welcome your questions. So please feel free to type your questions or comments into the chat box. And thank you, Christina, for providing those awesome resources there that were mentioned by Dr. Johnson and Dr. Ward. And while we wait for questions, I was thinking, because I'm, I, uh, I'm a Building Strong Brains trainer, it's it is very much like an adverse childhood experience because it's like on the, you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, it's it's a basic need. So I, I you know I have a question. <laughs> what? Um, oh, good. We have one in Q and A, but I'll ask my question. Are there? <laughs> do you, are you aware? You know, is there some data about? Um, you know some behaviors or coping mechanisms with uh, from people in America that are food insecure do I mean it seems like that could cause problems at school for kids or those kinds of things and either one of you can answer those and then we've got some great questions coming in so Dr. Johnson did you have some you had some information on what people do. Yeah, I, th I think that there are some, you know, coping strategies that families use that can be, you know, protective and, you know, be beneficial. Um, you know, some of those do include things that, um, we, you know, we talked a bit about relying on social support, um, relying on food assistance that could you know, occur from Snap and WIC, but also, um, you know, food pantries and, and other types of food assistance programs. Um, individual strategies like, you know, learn, you know, couponing, um, canning, preserving food, um, you know, things to that degree are some coping strategies that can have some positive effects on health um, that are coming to the top of my head. I'm sure I'll think of some more as soon as I jump off of here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in our curriculum, I know our food resource management tips include, you know, just checking what's in the fridge, making sure to not duplicate. Um, we do tastings as part of our curriculum, so which speaks to the the issue where kids need a lot of um, a lot of tries at certain foods and and especially vegetables, um, and that's okay and it's normal. But um, you know, if we do a tasting and we have a recipe. Um, I know we have one that has a little bit of cinnamon in it, and so it makes it, it kind of tricks, um, tricks you into thinking it's pretty sweet. And so kids like it a lot and they go home and they say, hey, I really like this, this vegetable. And so then their parents feel empowered to buy it and to prepare it um, and to do that, to do that well and to reduce waste, to reduce waste that way. But I would say, you know, also, um, you know, supportive policies are are not a, a way necessarily that families can cope, but supporting, you know, I'm really glad that at least Knox County, I'm not sure about the other um, counties in Tennessee are doing free lunch for all, all kids, you know. I mean, those are things that we can we can change on a on a systemic level to support um, food and security issues. Yeah. So um Great, thank you. And Connie has a question about the 28% um, receiving benefits. And Connie asks, does this mean that only 28% of those eligible receive benefits? And I think Connie's referring to SNAP. I would need to yes, go to SNAP. 28% receiving SNAP benefits. 
Um, and, I, and I was kind of wondering the same thing is, um, are there people that are eligible that perhaps do not receive it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think there's more people eligible than than sign up for a SNAP. And so that's why in our in our programming, our audience and our eligibility to essentially be counted in our programming is that they're SNAP eligible. There are a lot of there's a lot of bureaucracy involved in uh, signing up for benefits, and it can be difficult to navigate that, especially if you are a limited English um, a person with limited English and, and things like that. So, um, and there's a certain yeah. stigma. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great question. Thanks, Connie. Um, Leslie says, thank you for the resources for food insecurity. She is working on a grant and these resources are going to be really helpful for her in her community. Great. Yeah. And Chantal says, how are the response rates for the extension classes in Middle Tennessee? So are you getting a lot of participation in Middle Tennessee? Um, I'm not sure we have that data on hand. Is that yeah, disaggregated, but I can check and see um, mm -hmm. what it looks like in Middle Tennessee. Mm -hmm. But the, um, the North Nashville is part of Middle Tennessee, and I'm, I, I live close to there. I'm super excited about that because you're right, after the tornado and everything, that's cool. Yeah, and, it's, and it can be and it can be particularly um, vulnerable. And it's interesting, too, because it, it's a more urban area, and you would think that there isn't, um, there might not be an issue with getting to a grocery store. Like I mentioned, Benton County um, families often have to drive of far away and a lot of people don't have access to personal vehicles. So um, they might have to drive a long way to get to a grocery store. There might be stores with food in them that are close, um, but again, it's about afford affordability and availability of, of foods. Mm -hmm. Right. Let's see, Michelle asks, for people who are the working poor and not connected to a lot of social services, how do they find out about services in their county uh, when they aren't on social media? How do you help reduce embarrassment um, and how do they get involved is Michelle's question. So in terms of the, the TENSIP and FNEP programming, we are in community sites. Um, and so we're we're trying to meet people where they are. Um, so we have some uh, connections to to work sites, but it would be more so in community centers. And we have a PSE curriculum that is called Faithful Families. So we um, have something available for church groups that are interested. So we're you know we're in schools and senior centers and in places. Um, in places like that, so where people gather, so that so they might um, hear about a curriculum based on that. And a lot of our stuff and a lot of our budget, I can tell you, goes to print materials. So even though we are online, and especially online now um, with with COVID, um, a lot of our things still go through paper, and we still post on bulletin boards and leave brochures in the health department um, waiting room, things like that. And Amanda says that chant um, can help connect people with social services in the community also. So we have um, whatever county that you're in, you know, you can go to the county name and you'll be connected to our county extension um, office in in your county. That's a really great way to connect with the people that are there in your community. And so um, I know we'd love to get to get people connected that way. And so even if you could get our materials in your waiting room or things like that. So let's see, I see one more question up here. Michelle says, thank you. Um, Chantel asks, um, what can be done to address an area that has a food desert?
I, I can, you know, add, add, add sudden thoughts um, that, you know, there is the concept of food desert, but also, you know, food swamp and which it could be an area where there is food, but it's, you know, not access to grocery stores, but they might have, you know, a lot of um, accessibility to fast food, for example. Um, I, you know, there, there are some, you know, some some strategies that that could be considered. Um, one that we're um, working on as part of another um, funded grant, CDC funded grant that's happening in Hardeman County, Tennessee, is trying to work with um, a variety of partners across the food system to try to think of some innovative strategies to provide food. There's an area of the county that once had a grocery store, and um, it has recently closed. And so a lot of residents there are really having difficulty getting to a store. Um, you know, closest one might be 15, 20 miles away. And for some, that's quite, you know, really a really a challenge for them. And so we've been, um, you know, trying to work with our partners, including the uh, agriculture and natural resources agent in the county to um, implement a pop up farmers market in the downtown area, which is a fairly centralized and accessible area. Um, providing some support, um, so not only a, a pop-up market, but also um, having a producer or a farmer's market themselves accept SNAP and EBT benefits. Um, I know that Tensip and FNAP is also doing a lot of great work with um, small food retail stores, and I'll um, let Dr. Ward talk about that if she'd like. Yeah, so we have a program called Shop Smart Tennessee, and so we know that a lot of communities have only access to, say, a, a corner store um, for for their for their groceries or food. And you know, if you've stopped at a convenience store, a corner store, that the the food selection um, is a little bit more limited. Um, so what we've done is um, with. Uh, in consultation with our nutrition faculty. And Dr. Johnson, did you do any of the recipes for that? I did not. Um, it, it started before I worked with UT Extension. Okay. Um, so there's recipes for, or healthier recipes for food that you can often find in a corner store. Like, um, the so if we talk about low fat dairy, the cheese, the string cheese or cheese sticks that you can find there. Um, popcorn is a whole grain. Um, encouraging water rather than the sugar sweetened beverages, but also it's a program where we're in um, collaboration with the retail store owner and incentivizing providing healthier food. Um, and I know when I travel across Tennessee, I'll, I'll try to eat lunch um, at the places where I can find in the county. And it can be difficult sometimes, um, you know, Dollar General is everywhere. And, um, there are some that have the fresh produce. I think it's called the market, the dollar general market. I'm not sure, but um, you know, working with stores like that on a on a bigger level is a goal uh, to because we know that mo most people in Tennessee have access to a store like that. Um, so if we can provide work with store owners and provide healthier options, and then let people know what the healthier options are, um, we can change some behavior and diet quality that way. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good point. You're right. Dollar General is throughout the state. So that may be, that's interesting. Um, great. Connie asked, um, what organization or agency would be best to make a cash donation to support feeding our children? I don't have a specific one, but my idea is always that you're your money does go farther at food banks than than your food. So if you're donating cans of food, you're buying um, you're buying the food at the price that they sell it to you for, but they will discount it um, in bulk for the food pantry to buy it. Um, so your money will go farther when you donate directly to a food pantry. Hmm. Wow, I didn't know that. That's interesting. It's just yeah, the what is the economy of scale? Mm, yeah. The, those discounts, yeah. Let's see, someone was, uh, Chantel, when I was a child, lived I lived in North Nashville. There was a bus that would come through the neighborhood that was um, a grocery store on wheels. 
And she says she forgot that until now. So that's kind of an interesting idea. We have food trucks. Yeah. Uh, what about, yeah, that's kind of neat, Chantel. Yeah, more, more mobile food delivery would be really great. I know that there's another Nashville program, too, that does um, food preparation and, and distribution. So instead of distributing commodities or food that needs to be cooked and prepared, they're doing the, the preparation and then distributing the food that way, hmm. which is pretty neat. I wish I could remember the name of it. Hmm. Nashville's got some great stuff going on. It does. It does. Um, or do you know of any food waste program? So like when a grocery store, like the bananas are just too ripe, um, is, is any of that distributed? Um, do we have anything like that? Like, you know, a producer would uh, um, donate it and distribute it quickly? I can think of two um, things off the top of my head that get at food waste. Um, there is a, um, a statewide program um, focusing on reducing food waste at the consumer level, but then up to the institution level. And um, of course, the name of that program is not coming to mind. But if I um, I can try to do a quick search for it, um, I've spoken with them and they're um, they're really great. And so I'll try to find that link and, and drop that in the chat. Um, the other um, I can think of is the Society of St. Andrew, and there probably are other organizations as well, um, but they're cleaning organizations, and so they um, they work through volunteers to clean produce that may stay in a field um, at the end of maybe the season, for example, and then they um, clean that produce that would otherwise be wasted and directed into food pantry or a food bank. Um, so those are two organizations that that came to mind. Here in Tennessee. Wow, that's great. Let's see. And Chantel says Nashville Table may do things like that. So that might have been interesting. That. Yeah. Cool. And what about um, gardens? Do people is that a a program where uh, that's that people we could help people with is to create their own gardens and learn how to grow food. Yeah, I think gardens are really another great example of what, what we call a PSE. And so in one of our curriculums called Learn, Grow, Eat, and Go, and that, that happens in the schools, um, there are there's a garden project associated with that. So on my the funding that I manage is limited in terms of how how it can um, fund the garden itself. Um, through community partners and collaborations, our agents have been able to start gardens that um, at schools. Uh, there's one in Anderson County, I know, um, that gets kids excited about the food because they're seeing the process. They're getting they're they're part of the, the growing process, and then they get to eat it and sample it later. And it gets more buy-in from them. It's more fun. So we've seen that as a success. That's really neat. And then Michelle says Clarksville has a program for teens that provide work on a farm and then workshops about healthy eating and the food that's harvested goes into our local food. It's called the Food Initiative. That's great. Yeah. And James says a lot of churches have food program giveaways. That's another way. And Chantel Mer says Nashville Table merged with Second Harvest Food Bank. Okay. Both really good programs. Um, yeah, I think that's, I mean, I work for Department of Children's Services and we um, assess for uh, safety, well being, and um, permanency. And uh, it's definitely a really good assessment question in terms of access to food, healthy food, food security and security um, so that we can connect our families with um, these resources that you've discussed, um, as well as all the people here who are with uh, Department of Human Services and people with Department of Mental Health, our foster parents, all of you. Um, now we all have more tools in our backpack in terms of asking better questions and resources. 
So this is really interesting work. And the data that you presented really provides information about who those vulnerable populations are. So um, that's another way for us to assess and serve. Absolutely. I think I think you made, you know, a really pivotal point about Maslow's hierarchy. You really can't do much when you're hungry. Yeah. Uh, it, the what it does to your your brain and your body and it is connected to um, employment, parenting quality, you know, and it and like I said, it was it's intergenerational. And so when you make an impact and when you can make a change, it can last for a long time. Those impacts are long term. I think that's that's why we look at this and that's why we um, really believe in our work and the importance of it. Mm hmm. And I know I have a lot of people who are interested in brain development on the call too, and and proper nutrition is critical for healthy brain development and childhood development throughout the life cycle. Um, and it can I think it can often be overlooked sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Mm hmm. But it's it's very important. Do we have any other questions or comments? I really appreciate everyone telling us um, resources that you're aware of. I like learning about Nashville Table and the Food Initiative and checking with our faith-based agencies. I love it that Chant can help um, disperse this information. I love that we have talked about reducing stigma and reducing embarrassments about accessing food. And healthy food and Kim says, thank you for the information. Autumn says, thank you. Lori says, thank you. Wonderful. Well, Thank you so much, Dr. Ward and Dr. Johnson. I think um, this puts it on all of our minds about um, eating healthy ourselves, as well as uh, supporting the people that we serve in accessing healthful foods. So <clears throat> Michelle says this was great. Thank you all for participating. Thank you for your questions and your comments and sharing your resources. And thank you for the, the roles you do, the work you do. Again, we're all here to build that resilient community. And everyone we serve is, you know, is part of that community. Well, thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. I'm inspired to go have some uh, fruits and vegetables for lunch. So. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And um, for everyone on the call, you'll receive an email uh, uh, in the next few days with your certificate. The video will be on the TCCY YouTube channel in the next uh, few days as well. Thank you for joining us. And we'll also send out all these great resources so that you can just click and get back to uh, the Find My Plate and the CDC and also the UT Extension websites as well. So thank you all for your work and sharing it with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.